you're good to go, Catalin. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I am Katalin Resegi. As the president of the International Council of Onomastic Sciences, the organizer of this event, I am really happy to be here and open this online lecture series, Onomastics Online. ICOS is devoted to promoting scientific discussions about the different aspects of names and name usage. We also provide forums for researchers dealing with names. One of these forums is our annually published peer-reviewed journal, Onoma. The last volume on the dynamics of the anthroponymic system has just been released. The other traditional forum is the International Congress of Onomastic Sciences, held in every three years in different countries all over the world. The next venue is going to be Helsinki, Finland, and I hope we can meet in person in 2024. Besides these traditional forums, we would also like to take advantage of technology and this new online life uh, to advance the dissemination of onomastic sciences and the related scientific fields. The purpose of onomastics online is to provide students and researchers with state-of-the-art discussions on the different aspects of name usage. With the first lectures, we would also like to demonstrate the, the interdisciplinary nature of name research. And I am glad that we can offer four exciting lectures this semester. I hope you will find them interesting and thought-provoking, provoking ideas for new research projects. So I wish a great time for all of us for today's lecture and for the whole semester. And now, Peter Jordan, the chair. Thank you very much, Katalin. Um, dear colleagues and friends, it is a real great pleasure for me to um, introduce to you Derek Elderman as the speaker of our lecture today. Um, I think I would say he's one of the three stars on, in the sky of critical onomastics. This is a rather uh, relatively new uh, current of, um, of toponomastics focusing on the political and societal backgrounds of place names and on the constructedness of place names. The other two stars, I would say, are my, Maus Azayahu and uh, Reuben uh, um, Rose Redwood. And um, you, cannot, you can find them quoted in, in all the articles on critical toponomastics, as far as I know. Uh, Derek Ellerman is a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Tennessee in the United States. His research interests and published work focus on the role of place and street naming in the context of American identity politics and civil rights uh, struggles in the southeastern part of the United States. Uh, he is known for advancing scholarly and public understanding of the politics of street names, a street of naming streets after Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, one of his key toponymic works is, for instance, uh, Naming Places and Commemoration in the American South, which has been published in 2000, as year 2000, in the journal as a professional geographer. Uh, he served also in the years 2017 and 18 as a president of the American uh, Association of Geographers, AAG, Yes, so I think this is uh, should do <laughs> to introduce him. Um, um, we will have after his lecture um, some opportunity to uh, ask questions and to uh, to um, bring forward comments. Ten to fifteen minutes. I ask you perhaps to uh, to raise your hand to show up on the screen, in the, preferably and in the first line. You can also use the chat function, of course, but please show up on the screen. Uh, this makes uh, it more interesting and, and we would like to see you, of course. So um, now, Derek, please, you have the floor. Please uh, start the lecture. Well, uh, th thank you very much, Peter, for that very kind introduction and thank this group for this uh, fantastic invitation to join you today. Um, since the pandemic started, the worst words one can ever say is, let me share my screen. So I'm going to absolutely share my screen. 
and uh, that will be part of my talk. And if I can get uh, Peter, if you can give me a thumbs up or some signal that uh, we can see the screen. Yes, it's okay. All right, very good, yes. thank you. And, and that'll be the last, I, I'll burden you with the request. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about um, relaying critical place name studies to the classroom and specific, specifically talking about the cultural political moment we're in, in terms of the ongoing movements to reform uh, campus landscapes, universities, colleges, public, private schools, and so forth. Uh, before I get started, I, I need to, to really uh, recognize and acknowledge uh, uh, Ruben Rose Redwood, who is a co-author uh, and my longtime collaborator on a lot of these issues. And um, in fact, uh, this talk is derived from a paper that Ruben and I have authored in Journal of Geography and Higher Education. I'm happy to provide that paper to Peter and everyone else in the group uh, uh, for distribution if, if you'd like to have a copy. Or you can simply go online and probably download it just as easy as well. But uh, uh, there's a lot, there's a lot of content here. There's a lot to be covered. And so I won't be able to cover it all, but the, the actual paper probably covers uh, more of what people may want to hear if I don't cover it here. So, so as, you know, as Peter got to, I'm, I'm for the last couple of decades have had the real pleasure of watching and also contributing to the rise of what has been called critical place name studies or critical toponymic studies. And that's basically been an attempt to situate naming within a broader understanding of social and spatial processes. And in particular, there have been three sort of big areas in which critical place name studies has focused. On one hand, it focuses on this idea of place names being part of these larger systems of identity, storytelling, social and political discourse. Um, on the second, they also are embedded in everyday navigation. So place names are parts of the habits, the affects, the emotions, the embodied performances of people. And then the third aspect of a lot of critical place name studies, which we've already sort of hinted to with sort of the informal discussion before the talk, was that place names are a form of branding place. Uh, place names are involved in the claiming and the ordering and the coding of space. They've also been heavily used uh, as Mao Zazuyahu, who my close colleague would argue, been used to uh, involved in the cultural planning of nations and of directing nationalism and, and the imagined community of, of nations. My work has tended to focus on place naming in the context of social justice. And my work has specifically been looking at the uh, role that place naming plays within African-American black struggles within the South of Southeastern US and the US overall as they attempt to in many ways, to make an intervention in how we remember the past. You know, in the United States, for a long time, African American contributions, African American identities, histories were basically made invisible. And so, something like naming a street for Martin Luther King is an effort to actually make an intervention in that inequality and actually assert a right to public memory and to also public spaces. And often these struggles over remembering King are very decidedly about place. They're very decidedly about location and, and trying to make sure that King's name, uh, King's memory has a very prominent place within um, American cities. What I've become fascinated with over the last few years, um, and, and my colleague, Joe Stoltman, who's in the audience has heard uh, me talk about this in other venues, is I've become very interested in this battle geography over commemorative place names on university campuses, uh, college campuses, um, school grounds, and so forth. And what we have seen in the United States, especially in the Southeast, but really across the whole US, have been these movements to these calls, these campaigns uh, to rename places that uh, honor and valorize and commemorate uh, slaveholders, um, um, segregationists, 
uh, historical figures that are identified with the forces of white supremacy, um, anti-Semitic figures, uh, patriarchal figures, settler colonial figures, uh, all of these have come under question uh, as we try to come to grips with a greater sense of diversity and a sense of justice on our university campuses. I, what's really interesting to me as a teacher and a professor is that our students are often leading these struggles. And what we've seen in the United States, and I, I need to sort of break here and say that as much as I'm gonna be talking about these issues in the context of the US, they are very much happening globally. Um, and, and, but my, my, my observations and impressions will be sort of confined to what I know best. But what we see is that students are leading these campaigns and they really historically have been leading these campaigns now for many decades, but they took on particular uh, frequency and a particular importance uh, in light of the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis at the hands of a police force. And that has become a sort of a, a, a flashpoint for students and communities, teachers, staff, and administrators to think about, okay, how does white supremacy, how does it saturate the very symbols and the ways that we think about place and the way we, um, uh, you know, really think about uh, who we are as a nation, who we are as a people. And, and so what you can see here, I've just tried to bring out a few headlines to illustrate the kind of intensity, the kind of uh, real emotion-laden ways in which students are claiming uh, this process of naming. And, and here's, a, a, I think, it's one of my favorite photographs uh, at Middle Tennessee State University, which is just down the road from me, where uh, students for the last several years have been protesting in front of Forest Hall um, there on campus. Uh, seeking to have the name Forrest removed from that building because that building was named in the uh, early 20th century for a infamous KKK leader, Ku Klux Klan leader, also um, a Confederate general. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Confederate general and also a slave trader. And so the, the students there have been uh, working, I, 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 unfortunately unsuccessfully at this point, to get Forrest's name removed from that building. And you can see sort of this emotionality that involves place names. Sometimes we think place names aren't that really emotional, but actually they actually can be. And for these students, as well as many students across the United States, this is about how place names are interpreted in terms of student well-being. How does that name affect a, a student? How does it hurt a student? How does, particularly if it's a student of color, particularly a student from a marginalized group, and also, how does that name work against this climate of diversity that we're trying to build on campuses uh, across the globe, not just the United States? What, what strikes me um, is that we have these struggles going on. Students are playing a major role in these struggles, but seldom do we see formal, uh, formal curriculum. Seldom do we see sort of formal teaching on the politics of naming places. Um, and so I think there's a missed opportunity for us to transform our campus into what I'm calling, what you, what me and Ruben have calling, is these toponymic workspaces. These places where we can work through these tensions and study the campus place name landscape and hopefully offer some more progressive alternatives um, to those patterns. So the general purpose of my talk is I want to offer you, uh, and I'm sure you already have some pretty good ideas about how to take these issues on, and I'm sure you already in your classrooms or in your research labs or, or wherever the case may be, your own communities probably deal and speak to these issues. But I want to try to offer some anal analytical lenses for conducting some of this type of what I call critical place name pedagogy. And I want us to think about how can we assist students and teachers to document, analyze, and perhaps even reform the commemorative place naming, place names on their own campus. So, I, you know, you guys probably don't know me very well. Um, some of you know me better than others, but, you know, I, my career is embodied around the idea that I try to use my work to make a social difference. 
And so this is that vision that leads this sort of discussion that we have today. And I also want to try to give you some ideas of some instructional strategies for learning from these campus, what I call namescapes. And we're gonna talk about landscape backstories, affective ent entanglements, uh, procedural injustices. We're gonna be talking about what kind of language can we develop? What kind of strategies can we put in place to uh, give students, to give them the tools, give us the tools as teachers to uh, interrogate some of these place names found on campuses and, and maybe some uh, opportunities for reform. So as we think about some of these lenses, and I'm going to have to run through this rather quickly, so I apologize in advance for that. Each one of these lenses could be really unpacked in a lot of detail, and I just unfortunately don't have the time. But I think one of the things that we always have to do with students and ourselves is to emphasize the materiality uh, of place naming. The idea that with the naming of place is this commemorative infrastructure that often accompanies it. We've got to see toponyms as part of a larger built environment and also part of the racialized architectures of place. We have to realize and remember that uh, play, you know, place names give physical and form, they give physical form and permanence to places. And they also express power. And they're actually tools of power. They don't just express it, they actually are avenues for, uh, for exercising power. They're a resource, um, they're, they're a geographical resource that often serves certain interests and groups over others. And so one of the things I've been trying to do um, is try to develop this idea of namescapes, this idea of really moving the, moving the emphasis from just the name and the naming process to namescapes, to developing this idea of how does the naming process become situated within the social construction of landscape how does it get situated within these struggles to control and contest place? And so, for example, in my home region of the southeastern United States, there's a history of using the materiality of place names, their presence on signs and landscapes and mailing labels and so forth. There's this, uh, you know, a long history of using these names uh, and the places and spaces they mark as technologies of, of white power, uh, white supremacists throughout the time, uh, particularly since, uh, the end of the, since the end of the Civil War, have been using names to remind marginalized groups about who's in control. And by the same token, uh, uh, such as Black communities, they have used counter naming, they've used their own naming traditions and name spaces to exert a Black resistance to that control. And you know, it's important to realize is that at least here in the context of, uh, of America that when you look at a place name, it, it may seem to reference a period from the past, but it does not always mean that that name arose during that particular period of the past. And in fact, if you look at the geographic historical pattern of schools, in this case, these are public and private schools uh, before you get to college. Uh, there's a pattern of schools being named after Confederate generals. These were the generals that led the fight to uphold slavery during the Civil War. Um, you see a lot, 71% of these schools were named after 1950. And so you can't separate that materiality of that name and that commemorative infrastructure from the fact that white supremacists at the time uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, were actually using those naming patterns to uh, re-exert their control in the face of the civil rights movement and of black resistance uh, on behalf of their civil rights. I also wanna draw your attention to another important uh, analytical lens, which is, you know, affective politics. In other words, when we think about toponyms, they have an affective politics. They affect people in different ways, emotionally and politically. They have the capacity to exclude or include people. And with them comes the sort of politics of belonging. 
that as, as, as place names are interpreted, as they're uh, internalized by people. So I've been interested a lot in thinking, and this is very preliminary thinking, uh, thinking about the idea of toponymic atmospheres, the idea that a, a place name doesn't exist in a vacuum. It, it actually exists in a way and connects itself across human social life in ways that it can create this larger atmosphere, uh, positive or negative, for people. And it can contribute to the feel of a place. And I've also been quite interested lately, and this is all very baby steps at this point, in this notion of toponymic ecologies. In other words, if we think about names and name places and namescapes, they result from and they also mediate people's relationships with each other. They result and mediate the relationships that people have with institutions and places and social processes. And so I, maybe, maybe it's just a fancy word for getting at sort of understanding the relational geography that always exists around these names, particularly as they become these points of controversy on uh, college university campuses. And so I, I, I wanna show you a picture here. This is from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. This is now several years ago where uh, Chapel Hill had a, uh, a campus building by the name of Saunders Hall, which has now been renamed. And Saunders Hall was named after an early 20th century, uh, late 19th, early 20th century historical figure who was also a major leader of the North Carolina Ku Klux Klan. And if, for those who do not know, the Ku Klux Klan was a, a terroristic type organization uh, that uh, exerted um, um, extra legal control, intimidation, violence uh, against African Americans, against Jews, against uh, women, against a number of different uh, groups. And so you can see by these protests where these young women are referencing the, the politics of lynching uh, and is that they see that name is not just a name in and of itself, not just a historical figure in and of itself, but how does that name and that and the historic history fit into their own personal history of dealing with racism? And so, for example, those feelings about racism, those affective politics are not confined to how someone feels personally. They are connected to larger uh, institutional forces, larger ecologies of racism that have existed. So, for example, Clemson University in South Carolina uh, debated and eventually renamed their Honors College, which was previously named after John C. Calhoun, one of the most ardent defenders of slavery in the 19th century. They removed his name, but it's, you know, I would be remiss in not pointing out that the school itself, you know, the school itself sits on land that John C. Calhoun donated. And that land once was John C. Calhoun's plantation, where, in fact, he enslaved Black people. Um, and, and so you, you want to think about the fact of how the removal of John C. Calhoun's name is all part of trying to come to terms with these larger ecologies of racism and relationships with, with people and institutions and places and histories. Uh, the, the last analytical lens I want us to think about is I want us to consider, for example, and, and this may strike some people as a bit odd, but I, I promise you, if, if you read our paper, it's really explained rather well, and I'm going to do the best I can here, is that we need to realize that there's a relationship between violence and names, violence and place naming. And specifically, naming, as you guys probably know better than I do, you're the experts, Naming is not innocent. Naming is always grounded in violent histories of colonialism, patriarchy, and racism. And so what I have found or what I am discovering in my work is that the history of American place names is often wrapped up in this history of oppression. And in fact, there traditionally has been a tendency in American place naming to perpetuate a public amnesia about minority attachments to place and to the past. 
And so a lot of American place names historically were written in such a way to make invisible these attachments of people of color, indigenous groups, and so forth. And so this leads us to a, a very powerful concept by Karen Till, um, which talks about memory work. And I would suggest to you that if, if, if place names can be about violence, place names can also be about healing. And so building on Karen Till's work, I've argued that, you know, this idea of memory work, this, this idea of actually this labor of coming to terms with histories of violence is very much fueling a lot of the place name challenges and uh, calls for reform that we're seeing uh, on college campuses. And basically it's getting to the idea that place names uh, can perhaps facilitate some form of healing and community rebuilding. Although I would caution you, we don't, we don't need to put more, I think, confidence and names and place names specifically than, than we should, because it's not just the name itself. To go back to my earlier point, it's how the name gets connected and assembled within these larger ecologies, namescapes, and atmospheres related to oppression and anti-racism. Okay, I appreciate your patience for that. I, I know that's a little bit of a long haul, but I wanted to really make sure I laid some groundwork uh, to, to our discussion. And I would suggest to you, and I'm not the only person who has made this argument, is that our schools, at least in the United States, and I would, I would probably beg to say that it probably applies to a lot of schools in a lot of different regions of the world. Schools, we, we pride ourselves on diversity, we pride ourselves on e equity and inclusion, but we nevertheless historically and still to this day practice inequality. And so schools are wounded places. And there are also places that can wound certain uh, groups, particularly if we do not uh, reconcile these legacies of oppression. And so I'm interested in thinking about what role can campus memorial naming play in both inflicting, but also healing from those wounds perhaps. And how can we position our students and position our communities and position ourselves as researchers to take our ideas to the next steps so that it can be of some value to communities as they make these types of decisions. Uh, I would point out to you, this is I think a tremendous example of how these racialized wounds have a direct bearing on the decision of how and what to name. So um, there was a student who led a, move, uh, led a campaign in uh, Madison, Wisconsin in the United States um, about renaming James Madison High School, named after one of our presidents, who also was a uh, slave owner. Uh, she led this campaign to rename or remove the name of James Madison. And she, she in an interview, she indicated that her decision to, um, um, to make this proposal was actually motivated by racial incidents that she had experienced at school. So it wasn't just her sort of thinking about the history of James Madison. Uh, it was about sort of taking in that name, that namescape, that sort of history as it was impacting her personally. And so, she, for example, she talked about that she had been called the N-word numerous times around school. She'd even been threatened uh, with lynching, um, which was quite, uh, quite uh, traumatic. And so she suggested that School renaming was about truly caring about Black students. So it wasn't just a, a symbolic gesture. It was actually quite important to the work that she wanted and needed to have happen in her school. I, I'm happy to report that that school has now been renamed as of 2021. And that school now is, is named in honor of Belle Phillips. And Belle Phillips is one of the very first uh, Black graduates of um, um, Wisconsin Madison's Law School, and also a very prominent community figure and leader. And, and so this doesn't always happen this way, but sometimes on these campaigns, there's an effort not just to remove an offensive name and a oppressive history, but to also try to do the repair work of remembering those who tend to get for, forgotten. So it, it, as I lead you into talking about these strategies, 
I, I would encourage you, and I, and I know some of you are um, uh, teachers as well as researchers. I, I would I would encourage you. Let me go back. Sorry about that. I would encourage you to think about these toponyms that we found on colleges and at universities and at schools as sites of hidden curriculum. And what we mean by hidden curriculum is that what we teach in school, you know, there's the obvious curriculum of our lessons, our, our modules, our classes, but there's also the hidden curriculum that we still teach our students by the things that are unofficial, the unofficial lessons on who and what matters. And I would suggest to you that the names that we find on these campuses are a, are a hidden curriculum. They may not be part of the formal curriculum, although I would hope that they could be, but they are absolutely uh, very importantly, but more subtly influencing the way students see themselves, see their history, see their institution. And so I'm very interested in how do we incorporate critical place name study into this formal learning. And I would suggest to you, and, and I'm speaking for myself perhaps more than anyone, when I first started thinking about these issues, I realized I need strategies. Um, um, I'm not as smart as the average guy, so I need some help. Um, if we were in person, you would be laughing because I have all this really great humor, uh, but uh, I know we're on Zoom, which is a humorless technology. All right. And so one of the first things I want to get at, and one of the first strategies, is what I call landscape backstories. And, and, and this is a, a way in which we can help our students explore the the history, the politics, the origins of the names that they find on campuses. And this is probably a methodology that many of you already use to some degree and have some success with. But this is a case where you engage students in tracing and mapping the backstories of these campus names. You help them develop these, these biographical inventories. Who exactly is commemorated at, on your campus? Uh, by name? Um, and, and what is their race? What is their gender? What historical era are they from? More importantly, what role did they play? You know, was it a questionable role or was it something that should be upheld and, and celebrated even more? There's also the idea that you don't just sort of trace the name to who's the namesake, but you try to take apart the broader historical political origins of the name building. You know, who who, who put that name on that building? When did they do so? Why did they do so? And in fact, you know, how was the naming carried out? And what was the ideological purpose of it? If you recall that uh, photograph I showed you from Chapel Hill of Saunders Hall, and you remember the protest about Saunders being recognized with this building name. Well, part of the problem with uh, honoring Saunders uh, on that building was the idea that when they named that building for Saunders, they ex the, the UNC officials explicitly did so to honor his service to the Ku Klux Klan. So it wasn't an accident, oh, we've honored Saunders and he's affiliated with a white supremacist group. It was actually part of the ideological project that they were trying to do. And so this leads us to, you know, and I'm a geographer, I have this bias, this leads us to try to map the patterns and the inequalities and commemorative namescapes on campuses. We want to identify in a very material way who's excluded, who's not commemorated, uh, and not just who's not commemorated, is there a geographic material difference in where they're commemorated on campus, and how does that become important? So, for example, and I tend to be focusing a lot on Chapel Hill, so I apologize, but uh, students at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill uh, actually did a, a sort of a landscape backstory. The, these are all buildings on their campus named for various people. Wherever you see a white dot indicates a, a white person, male or female, although it tended to be overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly male. Uh, the, the white dot is the white individuals honored with a building name, the darker dots indicate black people who are honored with a building name. And in addition to the fact that there's a lot more white dots than black dots, there's also the idea that the black dots tend to be on sort of the periphery 
of the campus rather than in the center, the sort of historical heartland uh, of, of the campus. Students at Chapel Hill were also uh, encouraged and, and directed to uh, write what I call building essays. In other words, they didn't just map these patterns, they went into the archives to figure out, okay, when did this building get its name? Why did it get this particular name? Um, and, and so they were actually doing sort of a material history that surrounds that name that I think is quite important. And also very interesting to point out that there's a residence hall with my family name. Now, I'm not related to anybody. Uh, I come from a bunch of poor people in South Georgia. That's in the deep South, as we say in the United States. But there is a uh, there is a, a residence hall with my name on it. And then this is, uh, you know, I'm not sure how many of you guys know about story mapping, but story mapping has become a really innovative, important technology for, uh, come, you know, as a way of sort of merging georeference data with stories. And so this is what they've done at Princeton to sort of tell the story of these various buildings and their names and how they connect to the institution's history and also to institutional inequalities. And this is another really fantastic example. This is Edmund, Edmund Gordon at University of Texas in Austin, Texas. Um, and Edmund leads a campus tour of the various memorials, monuments, and name buildings on campus. And he uses that tour. He uses sort of that embodied sort of interaction with those uh, places and their names to tell the story of race relations on the University of Texas campus. And so he creates these institutional moments to sort of destabilize that normative history of the campus landscape that needs to happen so often. One of the other strategies that we can carry out is what I call sort of documenting these affective entanglements between people and name places. And, and keeping in mind that what this involves is recognizing that these name places don't exist separate from someone. You know, they are actually entangled and closely enmeshed in people's lives and biographies and feelings. And so we want as students and teachers to get a better understanding of what are these contemporary feelings and experiences and memories that people have. So even though we're talking about these place names on campus, as sort of part of history, we need to actually come into the present and figure out how are they felt, how are they interpreted, how are they internalize, um, and, and in particular, how do students of color and marginalized groups, um, it doesn't have to be along the lines of race, it could be along the lines of gender, ethnicity, uh, disability, ability, how do different groups react to seeing what many would describe as offensive names? And really, how is the name itself and how is the space around that name and the feelings it generates always in a state of becoming as that name assembles with these larger structures of feeling and oppression? And I know all these ideas are very heavy, but it, they got to be heavy. Because if we're going to make changes and we're going to teach about them and help our students understand them, we've got to, we've got to roll out some heavy concepts. Uh, and, you know, a really fantastic example of implementing this kind of strategy of untangling those effective encounters and, and, and feelings is uh, this idea of my, my colleagues, Deb Martin and Josh Inwood, uh, who years ago did a roving focus group on the University of Georgia campus there in Athens, Georgia. Um, and this roving focus group is that they took a group of students and they were largely students of color, uh, black, African-American, and they took them on a hike through the college campus and had them record and talk about and discuss and debrief on what are your feelings, your memories, your impressions of this name building, this particular symbol, this particular memorial, and they did that to try to not just find out how they interpreted those places, but how they, did they interpret those places within their own sort of racialized lives and their own sort of needs as, as marginalized communities on a campus, including on the fact that these same students, when they saw symbols that reference, for example, Holmes Hunter building, which references two students that integrated, racially integrated 
the University of Georgia. That's a very positive, progressive name and symbol. But what um, uh, Josh and Deb's uh, work discovered was that the students, they appreciated it, but they felt like it didn't completely speak to all the struggles that went into integration or desegregation and didn't speak to all the struggles that went into their own uh, racialized struggles. And it's important to realize that when we talk about these campus names, landscapes, that they're not just about dealing with sort of racist histories. These names often act as sites of racial microaggressions. And so um, Suzanne Ferguson, who's a very good colleague of mine, has written a fantastic dissertation on this and basically looked at the way that Black students and teachers in West Virginia internalized working and, and living around a school named after a Confederate general from the Civil War. And what she found was there was a need, not, not that she did, she just didn't speak to them to find out information or to find out their opinion. She realized through that, through that work that there needed to be a sort of truth and reconciliation process at schools because these, these names were exerting a lot of burden and a lot of trauma uh, on students and teachers that institutions need to reckon with. The, the last strategy I would encourage you to think about is, is exploring this notion of procedural justice. And um, I, I'm sure many of you know what this concept is and, and it deserves a lot of discussion, but very simply, when we talk about procedural justice, we realize is that even when you are able to uh, achieve a progressive social end, you can still have injustice if you are not had fairness in the political process that brought you to that result. And so what we have in the United States uh, is a history of not including marginalized communities in decision-making and policies that impact their lives and their places. And so this is about introducing students to procedural justice and encouraging them to do a critical reading of the school naming policies at their institution. So to go into the archives or go to uh, the policy office and get a copy, what is exactly the policy for renaming places? Uh, what does it look like? Who controls that naming process? Who gets to come before the decision makers? Um, how are renaming proposals handled? right? Is it handled in a very open, transparent way, or is it handled in a very top-down sort of closed door way, which it often happens? And what we're doing here is we're really trying to encourage students to be architects of their own campus, to think about how would they redesign um, campus place naming policy? Um, how, how would they construct a different kind of place name landscape uh, on their own campus? And I would point out that Ruben, who's, as, as Peter pointed to, Ruben Rose Redwood is absolutely a rock star uh, in terms of uh, place name study. And Ruben and his colleagues back uh, now, it seems not that long ago, but the pandemic has made everything so rapid. Uh, you know, several years ago now, Ruben and his colleagues did a survey of the place name re or place renaming policies in uh, thousands of universities in US and Canada and found that only 19% of all those universities had a publicly accessible naming policy. So if you're a student or a community member or, or a teacher or a staff member and you wanted to put forward a policy, you wanna put forward a proposal to rename and you needed to know the policy, chances are your institution does not have a policy posted. And really a very, very small minor percentage of those that had some publicly accessible naming policy actually provided for public consultation. In other words, even though they had a public a policy of available publicly, they still didn't really involve the public, which is even more frightening when you think about procedural injustice. And you know, one of the things that's a huge issue as we relate to uh, campus names is that increasingly, and again, I cannot speak for your universities, but in my universities in the United States, increasingly campus names are assets. 
uh, we sell and trade naming rights to our buildings all the time. And so if you have a donor with enough money, then that donor can in effect donate the money necessarily to get their name put on a building. And so this is one of the huge policy issues that is running straight in the head and in the face of campus place name reform. And I have suggested elsewhere, and I don't mean to quote myself, it makes me look like I'm arrogant, I apologize, but I'm, I'm convinced that when we, we need to start looking at this relationship between donors and names in terms of policy. And it really speaks to about who the university belongs to. And we've really got to start asking some hard questions about who does the university serve and for whom does it exist? And these policies speak to this issue, whether administrators know it or not. And I would suggest to you that because of procedural injustices, we can have a renaming of campus places that actually is quite progressive, but it's not a model of procedural justice. And I think we need to bring those two together. It's not enough simply to remove discriminatory names and, and, and reorient those places, but we also need to involve the very communities that have been impacted uh, for so long. And I would suggest to you that uh, we're in a period now where school university officials are increasingly using place naming for place renaming for political expediency. In other words, I see this a lot where officials will say, okay, yeah, this is an offensive name, let's remove it. And they're removing it to in effect change the subject to basically end any further discussion of injustices or racialized wounds. And I would suggest to you that it's quite possible in this particular case that we're doing some damage uh, and that what is seemingly progressive name reform actually denies rather than does justice. Um, because the point of the naming or in the renaming is not simply to replace the name. For the activists involved, it's often about trying to build the head of steam necessary to take on larger issues. And so as you know, this is my last slide, because I know I'm getting short on time. This is really about more than just removing a name. And we need to move beyond what's been called airbrush politics. We need to think about really doing memory work, memory work versus just public relations work. We need to combine the renaming with a reckoning with this institutional racism and the climate at universities. We need to think about naming as part of a larger assemblage. In other words, we need to think about how can we connect the renaming to anti-racist work, anti-racist teaching, community outreach. Um, really dealing with the settler colonial legacies of our institutions. We need to do, as my colleague Jordan Brasher has written about so beautifully, we need to do reparative naming. We need to create spaces to memorialize Black histories and names, Indigenous names, on their own terms and in their own right. And then finally, my last point is that we need to engage in what Rebecca Sheehan, a good colleague of mine in Oklahoma State, writes about this regenerative memorialization. We need to constantly be looking back at and checking um, our, our place name landscape, our commemorative landscape. We need to make it dynamic. We need to refresh it. We need to evaluate it. What harm does it do? What good does it do? We need to involve the larger communities. There needs to be a participatory process. Um, so anyway, I've, I've said a lot and uh, I'll, I'll uh, Thank you for having me, and I'll uh, I'll basically get out of sharing my screen. All right, I'm happy to take uh, questions. I think we got time for questions, don't we, Peter? I think you're on mute, Peter. Well, better, you need to turn on your microphone. <laughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Derek, for your lecture. And I think you have impressive, impressively demonstrated how important it is to erase awareness that place names are constructed. They are always reflecting domin the dominant political landscape or political force of the scene. And you have also shown ways how this uh, awareness raising can be effectuated. Uh, you have 
focused on the campus and I think very much can be done uh, on the on the campus level, uh, ex extending the, co the scope to the to a city at large. I would say that um, um, it, it is a very good practice and practiced in some cities already that a, a street name, the plate of a, a commemorative street name is shown after a person or after the event is, um, is, um, is, uh, is duplicated or this has added an explanation plate. A, a, a second plate is added, characterizing the person um, after which uh, this, uh, this, uh, this street is named. Uh, or um, explaining what was his role in history and so on. And this is uh, very important, I think, with ambivalent, with ambivalent historical figures. For instance, um, we in Europe, in the ninth, many people are commemorated from the 19th century. They have uh, in Europe um, been prominent persons and have done very much for a certain city, for instance, but have at the same time been had anti-Semitic attitudes, for instance, or in the German speaking countries, they were involved at the same time into the Nazi system and so on to some extent. And then it is, I think, very useful to explain on the one hand the merits of this person, yeah, and on the other hand, also the dark sides of this person. And this is yeah. practice already in some in some places. And it's it's a kind of history teaching, so to say, in the in the in the in the, in the cityscape, so to say. Yeah. And usually people look at uh, street names only like labels. Even the inhabitants of a certain street don't know who is behind this name, who, is, uh, who, who was the person who is commemorated there. But this would be a possibility to raise uh, awareness uh, and historical awareness. Yeah, and, and I would agree with you, Peter. And in fact, in New York City, there's an ongoing movement a campaign called the Slavers of New York where a group of activists go to streets that are named and buildings named for very prominent historical figures. And they've determined by doing this sort of history that you're talking about, they've determined with well, this person enslaved people. Mm -hmm. And so they're actually not pushing for the removal of the name. They're actually putting labels mm -hmm. and stickers on the actual material surfaces of the street sign and the buildings to mm -hmm. tell that story mm -hmm. that this person actually was enslaved. So your, your comment about sort of contextualizing and, and, and narrating these histories is very well taken. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, uh, the floor is open for questions and for comments. Please use this opportunity. Uh, Tremisel, you have the floor, please. You're the first one. Yeah. Well Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very interesting, very thought provoking. Um, I'm currently at the University of New Mexico in uh, Albuquerque. And mm. yesterday I was uh, a witness to a chalk walk battle between the opponents and proponents of mask mandates and uh, COVID vaccines. And I was wondering if, because uh, you were showing some protests uh, uh, against certain uh, names on buildings, if any such toponymic chalk walk battles also occur, uh, people trying to rewrite those names, like you just indicated, um, uh, in New York City. Um, and to turn it into a constructive process, um, um, have, have there been any attempts to create like a place naming uh, workshops for mm. students on campus and to try to come up with names that would be um, acceptable for a, mm. a wider uh, group of people and could perhaps hopefully stay um, for some time. Thank you. No, that, that, thank you so much for that question. It's a great question. And um, uh, by the way, love New Mexico, love, love Albuquerque, great place. Um, you know, I, I keep referencing Chapel Hill because I think I have a little bit more experience with that case study they actually engaged in that creative work about thinking, okay, what should be the name of Saunders Hall? And in fact, the activist um, sort of workshop, the idea of naming it after a very prominent African-American female author, Zora Neale Hurston. And they really pushed the, U, the um, UNC University administration to do that, which they did not. 
they ended up renaming the building Carolina Hall, which is very generic. And but they wanted to actually, um, you know, their creative result was, I think, a very reparative, very thoughtful um, sort of reference to um, remembering figures that we have historically ignored or forgotten. Uh, I don't think anyone really can forget nor is uh, Zora Neale Hurston. She's a tremendous author, uh, but they, they have engaged in that kind of workshop. Yes, thank you, Derek. Are there any other questions or comments? Yes, Susan, please. Uh, thank you. That was that was great, Derek. Um, uh, I'm working at the University of Nottingham at, at the Institute for, uh, for Name Studies there, and um, we've been looking at uh, Nottingham street names and, in fact, how we can create teaching resources at what in the US would be elementary level school um, to talk about Nottingham's uh, links with the transatlantic slave economy. Um, one of the things that um, I was interested in uh, hearing you say was about how renaming can facilitate healing. And um, it's, I think, a bit of a political hot potato in the UK, because, of course, of course, you're absolutely right. But it can also create tension, uh, particularly for uh, far right and alt right groups um, and I think it's fair to say that this idea in the UK is, is creating um, political tension. Um, have you encountered that in the US? And what, uh, what advice do you give uh, to people working on uh, this subject area in terms of, um, in terms of that, essentially? No, no, and, and uh, Susan, it's so nice to meet you and so, um, so great to learn about that work going in Nottingham which I've actually been following a little bit. So it's a great pleasure. Um, I wish I had a really good answer for you. We see the same problems here in the United States where increasingly there's this idea that if you generate critical debate about these names or other symbols, then you're being divisive. And frankly, that's a very white supremacist sort of, and I'm not trying to label anyone in the UK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll just speak about the US. It's a very traditional historical white supremacist defense which is somehow the maintenance of social order takes precedence over social justice. And I think this idea of actually distinguishing between, and I'm pulling directly from Martin Luther King, a negative versus a positive piece, the idea that, you know, you're actually about trying to affect social justice. And, you know, I, I will say at Walford College there in um, um, South Carolina, Spartanburg, South Carolina, there's a group of activists who, who really have been pushing their institution to take on these issues and their, their administration pushed back with that argument. But they kept engaging in dialogue. They kept engaging in meetings. It was not about imposing a top-down vision. It was about actually creating dialogue. Now that dialogue can get messy. It can get heated. Um, but it, it's, it, it's, you know, I, I think the important point, and I'm probably not sufficiently answering your question. It probably would take me a year to come up with a good answer is that we've 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 got to move beyond just sort of this idea that we are dividing each other in other words it's not that the, the renaming is dividing anybody the renaming is exposing attention that has always existed so all it's doing is opening up what's already been there and and maybe laying out that pretext is important for framing some of these debates. But let me say, here in the United States, it doesn't matter how much of that I would do or anyone else would do. We have, I mean, right now in Tennessee, we have far-right politicians um, banning books, burning books, and telling us that in K through 12, we cannot teach critical notions. I don't talk about critical race theory, any sort of critical discussion of race. And we're feeling it here at the university as well. So we're, we're you know, we're in a, a real tough spot as a global society. And um, yeah, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to be careful. We need to do it right way. But we cannot shrink from the pressure. Mm -hmm. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I think that 
uh, placing in conflicts are always just a symbolic surface of a deeper of deeper conflicts of deeper political and societal conflicts. Yes. Um, thank you very much, Derek. Are there any other questions or comments? We are already exhausting out. Have already exhausted. Yeah, I, I talk time. too much, Peter. I'm sorry. No, 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 not at all, not at all. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. Well, if there are not uh, no urgent questions or comments anymore, then I would like to thank you, first of all, Derek, again, for being available for us for this very interesting lecture and, um, and, and also for the discussion here. And I'm looking forward to see you at the next toponymic occasion, perhaps <laughs> somewhere in the, on the globe. And uh, thank you all, dear colleagues and friends, uh, for joining us uh, with, this, uh, with this lecture. And I would like to invite you for the next uh, session, the next lecture of this lecture series, of the ICOS lecture series, uh, which is on the 24th of March. And it will, uh, be, be, will be presented by Martin Thiering from the Aachen University. Uh, and uh, he will speak on toponyms and landmarks as cognitive maps with indigenous languages spoken in Alberta and Canada and in New Guinea. So thank you very much for the day and have a, have a good time. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Yep. Goodbye. Thank you, Derek. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much.